Do you seriously want to be happy? Well, of course you do. Uh, the United States Declaration of Independence guarantees the pursuit of happiness at least. It doesn't actually guarantee that you will achieve happiness, but it guarantees you the right to pursue it. And uh, you must have noticed in the news that David Cameron and his government are also interested in uh, your state of well-being as monitored by various questionnaires that they're getting up. I have to say that the idea began in the kingdom of Bhutan, uh, which I think is a Buddhist country close to the Himalayas there somewhere, and they have been monitoring happiness in their citizens for some decades now, so it's not a totally original idea. Now, what does it take to be happy? Um, psychology has spent a great deal of its history looking at the downside, looking at things like depression and psychopathology. Only recently have they become interested in what has been called positive psychology, that is, um, looking at the factors that might be responsible for making people feel good. Now, when it comes to the question of what will make you happy, I think the first thing to be certain of is that we should not assume that other people are responsible for our happiness or our lack of it. Uh, people say to themselves, if only my partner would treat me better, be more loving and, and attentive, then I would be happy. Not true, because, of course, uh, if they did pay you more attention, then you would find uh, other reasons for feeling miserable. Perhaps your boss is demanding more of you than you are able to, uh, to give. Your job is boring or stressful. Other people are unappreciative of you. You would soon find uh, another reason for being unhappy. And the reason for this... Uh, let me just... Uh, show you that second slide, <laughs> yes. Uh, happiness uh, seems to have a set point in people. Some people are characteristically happy and uh, others miserable most of the time, almost regardless of circumstances about them. And a major reason for this, of course, is that to a considerable extent, happiness is a constitutional trait. Something like 50 to 60 percent of variation in happiness seems to be carried in the genes uh, and uh, of course um, there's no single gene that would account for it uh, probably uh, a large number of genes operating in concert will determine that happiness set point uh, and they overlap with the genes that uh, determine personality people who are emotionally stable sociable and conscientious in the, uh, the big five personality classification are the ones that tend to be happier. Now, I say that happiness is multi-genetic, but uh, there is at least one gene that has been uh, connected specifically with life satisfaction, and that is uh, the 5-HTT serotonin transporter gene. There are two forms of it. People who have two copies of the long version uh, seem to be twice as happy on self-report as people who have two short versions of the 5-HTT gene. If you've got one of each, one long, one short, you tend to be intermediate in your level of self-reported happiness. Uh, so that's one gene that seems to be involved, uh, perhaps... Um, all of the others are in diminishing power. Uh, but it's no surprise that uh, this is a gene that determines the efficiency with which serotonin is transported around uh, these various brain areas depicted in that diagram. Widespread areas of the cerebral cortex respond to the neurotransmitter serotonin. And it's no accident that... Um, most of the modern antidepressant drugs operate by giving a boost to serotonin in the brain in one way or another. Um, the most uh, Prozac, I suppose, one of the best known uh, antidepressants, and that is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, uh, which um, 
There's a bit of complex logic involved there, but it results in serotonin being more effective in the brain. Now, it's widely believed that money makes people happy. Well, <laughs> in fact, that is totally simplistic. There is no easy relationship between wealth and happiness. Once beyond the level of poverty, uh, increases in wealth do not reliably translate into increases in happiness. Winning the lottery will give you an immediate rush of euphoria, but it does not uh, inter, uh, ensure long-term contentment. As a matter of fact, lottery winners have been found to take progressively less pleasure out of everyday events following their win. Uh, the, the euphoria quickly burns out, habituates, so that they go back to where they were before, and uh, more than that, in the meantime, they've possibly burned a lot of bridges with their previous grounding. They've upset their friends and sold their house, moved to a different neighborhood, uh, thrown in their job. All of the things that were a source of identity and self-esteem have been put behind them. And when the buzz of being suddenly rich is worn off, they've spent the lot or given it away to their greedy friends and relatives, uh, they are left, often left feeling less happy than they were before they won the lottery. How about a slow increase in income? That doesn't make for greater happiness either because the more we have, the more we seem to want. This is called the Easterlin effect after the man that identified it, uh, which means that we're effectively stuck at the same level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction be because our hopes and expectations are shifting as fast as we acquire new wealth. Uh, you can see it quite well in this diagram. As a matter of fact, uh, in most Western countries, uh, this is the United States, uh, I think, and we're looking at the percentage of people who consider themselves very happy, which are the yellow dots along the bottom. Uh, and the red is the increase in gross domestic product, really, the average income in thousands of dollars. And what you can observe at a glance is that uh, income, average income of people has been rising astronomically even beyond inflation, I have to say, uh, whereas uh, average happiness is flatlining. You can look at cross-national differences. There are some. Uh, you can see around the world there that North America, northern parts of Europe, Australia and New Zealand uh, report themselves as being particularly happy. Uh, some Gulf states, interestingly, there in the middle, uh, Venezuela, some areas of South America, uh, claim to be more happy than average. Other areas, um, the, the, the gray incidentally means that they have no measurement available, so the, the least happy people are those in the lighter yellow colors. Uh, you notice that they uh, particularly around Africa and uh, the Soviet bloc countries, Pakistan as well. Some of the factors other than the wealth of a nation that have been implicated are things like uh, life expectation, uh, inequality and democracy uh, as a political system seem to relate to... Um, to happiness. When I say inequality, inequality <laughs> makes for unhappiness. So uh, high life expectation, high levels of democracy and political equality will make for happier uh, people on average within that country. Another way of looking at similar data there, you can see that there is a tendency for richer countries to be happier. 
as self-reported. Uh, the happiest countries tend to be Western European countries, Canada in, and the United States. Japan is up there somewhere as well. Uh, Australia and New Zealand would be, if they were, uh, had been measured in this particular study, would also be up with Canada and the United States. Uh, the African countries in the red dots at the bottom left there, I'll get the pointer going, tend to be low in per capita income uh, and low in self-reported happiness. African countries there. Now, the, the more interesting groups are that Latin American countries seem to be happier than you would expect on the basis of their GDP. And uh, the old Soviet countries, Eastern Bloc Europe countries there, uh, tend to be less happy than you would expect on the basis of knowing their income alone. And we could speculate on all kinds of reasons why that might be so. Uh, in the case of uh, Soviet bloc countries, it might have been the political system that uh, they were unhappy with. Latin America, uh, religion might have something to do with that. Uh, but we'll discuss that again later. Now, if wealth doesn't bring happiness, how about spending it? <laughs> uh, well, shopping gives enjoyment uh, particularly to some women. It is known to raise serotonin. Uh, but once again, like winning the lottery, the buzz tends to be short-lived. And shopping in particular seems a little bit desperate in that uh, all of the research shows that it connects with emotional instability uh, and is more shopping sprees are more likely to occur at the PMT phase of the female cycle. Uh, and uh, the, it, it often seems to be a response to depression, hence the term retail therapy. There is something uh, desperate about it as though it is an attempt to grasp at, at happiness which is felt to be absent in some way. And that, uh, as a result, of course, we don't uh, imagine that it is going to be any long-term <laughs> solution uh, to whatever is, uh, emotional problems are driving it. As a matter of fact, uh, most of the women who shop like the lady depicted there regret it later on. They think it's a great thing until they get it all home and there isn't room in the, the wardrobe for it and they're trying to take it back the next day and, and so on. And uh, a lot of shopping sprees. Uh, a sort of impulsive behavior that um, has its, develops its own momentum, quickly gets out of control, and uh, people tend to regret it later. The only sort of um, shopping that might provide some sort of long-term happiness is buying things for other people. Uh, for reasons that we'll describe later, that generally speaking, it is better to give than to receive. Now, there are very uh, complex relationships between age, sex, and happiness. What we see there is uh, some data with um, 340,000 people in the United States uh, collected by U.S. Um, Gallup poll, and uh, you can see that typically people start by being fairly happy when they're young. Happiness declines until the middle years uh, and then tends to improve steadily beyond the, that time. So that, surprisingly, people are happiest when they've reached the age of uh, 70 or 80. Uh, perhaps it's relief at having made it to that age and thinking, well, <laughs> nobody can take anything away from me now. If I drop dead tomorrow, I would have had a pretty full life. Maybe that's the way that works. Uh, the sex differences, you can see that uh, women tend to be happier than men when young. Uh, they converge for a while in the early senior years and 
then the women take over as being slightly happier again uh, in the latter years. Now, um, it's interesting that the data tend to show that women are not getting happier over the years. Uh, there was some interest in the idea that as women became liberated, uh, as they gained equality and uh, more political power, uh, more equality in the workplace and so on, that perhaps they would be happier. Uh, in fact, uh, as you can see from this data, uh, if anything, the women are declining slightly in happiness while men are remaining on a plane. This is just uh, the other end of the same dimension, which doesn't show anything very different. But it is interesting that um, for all the political gains uh, in, and greater freedom of women, uh, they are no happier than men and they're no happier than they were before any kind of political uh, equality was gained. Blacks tend to be less happy than whites in the United States, but this is a difference that has been diminishing over recent decades, and one would like to think that that was a result of a drop in racism. Going back to the male-female uh, difference, there are some subtle differences between men and women in the perceived sources of happiness. Men tend to rate uh, sexual activity, sports, and being liked as significantly uh, more important than women. Women attach more importance to helping others, uh, to close family, and to being loved by loved ones. Uh, that said, it, it shouldn't blind us to the fact that men and women generally derive happiness from the same things, and that's just a slightly different weighting of uh, the particular factors involved in happiness. For both sexes, things like freedom from stress, family support, and uh, personal relationships are extremely important. In fact, those come top for both men and women, and it's only at the lower levels that uh, the, the rankings are slightly different. Now, one thing's for sure, happiness does not come in bottles or capsules <laughs> of any kind. Uh, they may give you short-term euphoria. Um, obviously, certain drugs like cocaine will, and heroin will do that, that, but there is almost certain to be some sort of uh, payback, some sort of... Uh, bounce effect whereby you feel good for a while and you feel even more miserable later on. Prozac, uh, I mentioned before, uh, and antidepressants like that seem at best to be able to lift people who are on the negative side, the depressed side of the continuum. They, at one stage it was hoped that they might be happy pills and that if the entire population took Prozac then uh, everybody would be a great deal happier. Uh, and um, th there was at least one book written to that effect, uh, vaunting um, Prozac as a happy pill. Uh, that has not uh, proved to be the case. At best, they will lift depression in people who are seriously depressed. And um, at the same time, they, they may make it more difficult to learn proper coping strategies. So those are some of the things that don't <laughs> give you happiness. What can we do about it? Well, returning to that earlier data, um, a review of all the research on what determines happiness confirms the fact that genetics uh, supply a sort of a set point for the individual and account for something like 50% of the variation. Yeah, that's the genetics. See, these greens are not easily distinguishable <laughs> on the screen here, but that's the genetics area. And um, there is a, a tiny little bit of the pie chart there which has been described as environment here. 
meaning those aspects of the environment that, uh, that you are a victim of, the things that happen to you, the dirty deeds that the environment uh, uh, perpetrates upon you. Um, much more important than that are the things that you make happen, the activities that you engage in. These seem to account for much more variation. So your happiness is much more under your own control, in your own hands, than many people imagine. It is important to exert control over your life, to adopt a positive attitude. Uh, you need to overcome feelings of worthlessness, build confidence, self-esteem. These are the important things. Destructive self-talk may be part of the problem. A lot of people judge themselves rather too harshly. They apply standards to themselves that are more uh, punishing than they would apply to others. Uh, they will tell themselves, for example, that one little mistake means that they are a total and utter failure, that they are a worthless human being because something has gone wrong. They tell themselves that um, other people um, don't really mean it when they compliment me, they are just uh, trying to be nice or polite. Uh, they will punish themselves for real or imagined guilty deeds, uh, things from the past that perhaps uh, should be put behind them as water under the bridge. They focus on regrets rather than achievements. These are all destructive thought patterns that need to be identified and replaced by more positive uh, thoughts. And this is the rationale of what is called cognitive behavior therapy, which is probably one of the most successful procedures for treating depression. Um, the history of psychotherapy has shown that um, lying on a couch and uh, telling some bearded chap intimate details of your childhood sex life uh, is probably not going to be all that beneficial. <laughs> But uh, identifying problems in the here and now and uh, devising strategies for addressing them positively uh, is much more likely to produce a positive result and do it quickly as a matter of interest, you know, within a matter of weeks. Whereas you can spend years in psychoanalysis to little avail. Ridding ourselves of... Pointless worry is, uh, is something quite important. Y you might m remember the film Dr. Strangelove, which has the subtitle, I don't know whether you can read it there, How I Learned to Stop wor Worrying and Love the Bomb. Uh, and there's a serious uh, point underlying that, that uh, there's no point in worrying about things that you cannot alter. If you can alter them, uh, go ahead and do so. And I suppose that's what some of the CND protests were all about, an attempt to alter the likelihood that people were going to be blown to smithereens. Uh, but if there is a situation that you cannot do anything about, then you're best to accept it and to move on. It helps to keep a sense of proportion. You have to ask yourself, is what I am worrying about really important? Will it matter in 10 years' time? for example. And uh, it may help to recall the plight of a chap called Philip Wakin, who in 1926 was helping to set up a target bait, boat for the Royal Navy to take pot shots at. And his mates left him behind inadvertently on this target boat uh, overnight while the Royal Navy was pounding it from a distance. And uh, they must have needed the target practice because he got through the night <laughs> without being hit. But uh, any time you think you've got a, a worry, you might like to uh, compare yourself with <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Philip Wakem and his situation. You might find that your own worries fade into insignificance. If they don't, then telling somebody else about them is another uh, constructive way of helping to keep them in proportion somebody else might be able to reevaluate them and reconstruct them more positively for you. 
A sense of humour is a good thing. Being able to laugh is a great buffer against um, adversity of any kind, or at least damage from it. It's an antidote to depression. Ken Dodd claims to be OBE, one boiled egg. Uh, I think that's um, <laughs> probably a, a reference to Bruce Forsyth getting uh, a knighthood before him. <laughs> but there's a case of his sense of humour uh, seeing him through. Loss of the ability to laugh is one of the most striking symptoms of depression. And you see it in uh, mental patients of many categories that they seem to have lost their sense of humour. So anything that can be done to augment it uh, ought to be beneficial. Of course, there are uh, comedians of different genres. Uh, there are those that are sort of embittered and hostile, like Joe Brand or John Cleese, perhaps. And at the other end, there are those that are sort of warm and jolly, like Ken Dodd or... Uh, Tommy Cooper. And it might be that uh, these different types of comedians have different effects upon their audience and uh, cater to people with different problems. One thing is for sure, uh, comedians are not themselves immune to depression. Uh, there is some indication that their suicide rate uh, might be slightly elevated. But uh, what is not clear is whether it is elevated in relation to the population at large or to actors, performers in, in other areas that are not specifically concerned with uh, comedy because uh, being a celebrity uh, carries a higher risk of suicide, something like four times that of the rest of us. Mind you, for most of the rest of us, if we topped ourselves, maybe nobody would even notice. <laughs> It seems to be important to have um, some overarching life goals and values. Most people who are happy seem to have a sense of meaning or purpose to their life, rather than drifting, away, uh, away from, drifting along from day to day. They've got a set of organized values and goals that they are trying to achieve. Now, religion may provide a structure of that kind, but um, so can humanitarianism. Uh, even atheism, I believe, there's some evidence that uh, uh, being a committed atheist like uh, Richard Dawkins uh, give, provides an equivalent <laughs> level of happiness as, uh, as having a traditionally religious faith. Uh, it was often, oh, before I go on, um, there are other um, life structures that might be equally valid family values, artistic um, values, scientific aspirations, career ambitions might all provide uh, that sense of meaning to your life that will be uh, just as important, giving you a sense of identity, something to look forward to. Uh, going back to religion, though, it's um, often been suggested that religious believers are generally happier than non-religious people. It's recently been discovered that it seems to apply only within groups and nations where there is considerable life stress, things like starvation and poverty. In those countries, uh, which tend to be more religious than, uh, than the relatively um, affluent parts of the world, uh, then uh, religion seems to provide for them some social support, some meaning in life, uh, that um, will see them through. The more affluent countries, and uh, used to include Britain, um, <laughs> whether it still does is perhaps arguable, uh, tend to be less religious on average, and um, they tend to be, uh, religion does not correlate with happiness. The non-religious individuals are equally happy. So it's a, that's a complex relationship between religious belief and happiness. Happiness is often a byproduct of keeping active. It's something that happens while we are tackling life's challenges. 
But uh, merely keeping busy may not be enough. We need to be doing things that raise our self-esteem and that bring us satisfaction. Uh, people tend to have demands placed upon them by other people uh, that may be irrelevant to their own values and just add stress to their lives. Uh, in that case, taking control of their own timetable, uh, deciding priorities and saying no to some things from time to time uh, may actually be better than being totally compliant. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to be selfish because um, major goals can still be altruistic. And there is considerable research to show that, um, uh, that volunteer work, community involvement of some sort will raise happiness, uh, particularly in, in older people, but then very often they are the people who do the, the volunteering and, and the charity work anyway. Not surprisingly, um, un unemployment is not good for your happiness. Uh, it will reduce self-rated happiness scores by something of the order of 5 to 15 percent on average compared with people who are in work. And that is even after the loss of income involved in, in losing your job has been controlled for, taken account of. Uh, there's a a study which sort of connects with this issue um, showing that uh, these are various United States or states of the United States There's probably about 48 or 52 of them or something I didn't actually count them um, but generally speaking there is um, a relationship between unemployment uh, and self-rated well-being. So that's well-being, that's unemployment, and uh, your well-being tails off uh, in connection with the extent of unemployment. It's, uh, you can see that it is not a very powerful uh, correlation. There's a lot of variation around it, but it is just enough to be significant across states. Um, the, the more powerful data, of course, comes from looking at um, unemployed against employed people within a particular state, and that's where you can see the effect much more strikingly. But I just happened to come across that graph and thought you might be interested in it. Uh, now, self-employed people seem to be even happier. Uh, that might be because they have a sense of control and that they're more likely to be doing work that they enjoy. Commuting has been found uh, to lower life satisfaction, uh, but not sufficiently to offset the value of having a job in the first place. It is better to commute to a job than not have a job at all, in other words. But the ideal is to be working somewhere where you don't have to travel long hours um, on unreliable, dirty public transport. Health is clearly uh, related to happiness. It generally uh, facilitates happiness. Uh, there was a study I read in the paper this morning coming out of University College London that um, showed that people who rated themselves as happy at one point in time were something like 30% more likely to have lived five more years beyond that point of data collection. In other words, happier people have a better life expectation. Uh, of course, they might be expressing happiness because they're feeling good and they're feeling good because they're healthy and <laughs> therefore uh, less likely to, to drop dead tomorrow. Uh, that, that could well underlie it, but nevertheless, it's an interesting fact. But that said, that people who have a permanent disability very largely adapt to their situation. There was a study done of people with what is called locked-in syndrome where they have uh, damage to the spinal column, a bit like um, Captain Matthew, what's his name, in Downton Abbey, Abbey. Um, and they are unable to move any part of their body uh, except perhaps uh, give you a wink or a nod uh, 
uh, above the neck. Now, the interesting thing is that the majority of those people um, will claim to be happy if you can find a way of measuring it, and there are techniques for getting responses from them. They claim that they are feeling great and they certainly have no desire for euthanasia. Um, perhaps that's why they say they're happy, because they're afraid you might be uh, going to put them forward to a, a Swiss clinic or something <laughs> when they would rather uh, live with the disadvantage that they have. Uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, you will be familiar with, of course, the, the great um, um, cosmologist, physicist, uh, claims to be happier now than he was when he was a young man and fully able-bodied. And uh, talk about um, looking on the bright side. Uh, he says, well, you know, most people with my condition would have been dead a long time ago, and here am I still going strong. Uh, I'm very fortunate because I am in an occupation where I don't need my body. I'm not an Olympic athlete. My brain is still good, and uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, so uh, that's what's most important to me. So uh, Stephen Hawking uh, claims to be happy. Uh, quite remarkable, isn't it? Well, um, it seems that to a large extent uh, it's the habituation process that comes to the rescue of uh, disabled people, rather like the kind of thing that takes the edge off winning the lottery. It's just the, um, the flip side of that. Although that said that um, despite what Stephen Hawking says, adaptation is seldom 100% com complete, which uh, wouldn't surprise you because it, it's always possible uh, to compare yourself with others that are more fortunate th than yourself, um, the reverse of what Stephen Hawking has done. If we control for income, people living in the country t tend to be more satisfied with life than people living in the urban city. Uh, of course, that might be due to congestion, pollution, or various other forms of stress in city living. Um, but regardless of where you live, communing with nature makes you feel good. That is, uh, the more exposure you can get to trees and flowers and water and open sky, uh, the better you will feel. Uh, and the probable reason for that is that um, this is the environment for which we are adapted through evolution. And we feel best because it's an environment that is good for our survival. Having some fresh water, having some trees about, more likely to find food when there are trees around. Blue sky makes us feel good because uh, you know, we don't have to worry about getting wet. Uh, so we tend to feel better uh, in a natural environment. And the natural environment for human beings is probably somewhere between uh, a jungle on the one hand and a savanna on the other. And uh, I immediately think of a golf course <laughs> as being the ideal uh, habitat for human beings. Uh, one thing's for sure, what is called green exercise, things like golf, like gardening, like um, walking, cycling, uh, horse riding, the sort of things that involve both exercise fr and fresh air and uh, contact with, uh, with a natural surrounding are particularly good for our happiness. I mean, exercise is good anyway, but I'm not trying to put anybody off going to a gymnasium because uh, the exercise is good in itself, but if you can do that exercise in the outdoors, even better. Well, it will save you paying a fee to the gym and, uh, and the benefits are even greater. Now, how about the effect of climate on happiness? Well, it's rather complex. Uh, obviously, we all feel better in a rainy, cold climate. When the sun comes out and the sky turns blue, we tend to feel a little bit better by comparison with how we felt before. 
But people who live continually in those climates habituate <laughs> again so that they don't tend to be any happier than people in a relatively miserable climate like Britain. Uh, we <laughs> we um, know that darkness tends to make some people particularly depressed, winter depression or seasonal affective disorder, it's been called, uh, and it doesn't help when the clocks go back and uh, add an hour of darkness for the time when the majority of us are actually awake and functioning. Uh, so there is a period in, across the winter where people uh, tend to feel more depressed, some more th than others, but that's due more to the levels of light, I think, than uh, it is to the temperature. Uh, Cross-nationally, the, the situation is rather complex. The, the Soviet bloc countries over here tend to be both cold and unhappy <laughs> down in there. But if you want to look at the countries that are happy, they span a wide variety of different uh, average temperatures. Um, they include cold places like Norway and Sweden and Iceland, the Scandinavian countries down here, but also some very hot places like the Philippines, Venezuela and Puerto Rico. Uh, and some temperate ones like Australia and New Zealand. So the, uh, you can be happy in a wide variety of different climates, it appears. And hence the relationship with climate is by no means simple. Well, if the climate is miserable, what can you do about it? Maybe go on a, on a happy holiday. Does a holiday make you happy? Well, the research tends to show that people who are preparing to go on a holiday, who are anticipating an exciting, happy holiday, uh, are happier than people who do not have a holiday to look forward to. But by the time they come back, there isn't all that much difference <laughs> on average. Uh, some people who have had a particularly relaxing holiday seem to benefit from it and feel happier, but it's a short-lived uh, effect and um, has dissipated uh, usually within a month or two at most. And the researchers who did that study, Dutch researchers they were, uh, recommended that people should take multiple short breaks <laughs> rather than one long holiday. Good relationships uh, with a small number of intimate people count for a lot more than having a lot of friends on Facebook. <laughs> it's the people that, uh, that you are really literally close to and uh, they are long-term friends and family, people that you could count on for some sort of support in times of trouble. That's what seems to matter rather than having a very large number of um, itinerant, casual acquaintances. Um, having children uh, certainly helps because that's somebody that needs you and uh, having a pet may have uh, be, be an approximation to having children in that pets, as we know, are surrogate or substitute children. It's good to have people who depend upon us because, again, one of the key points is being able to, to help other people and contribute to their happiness uh, has a spin-off that it makes us happy at the same time. To modify the Kennedy quote, ask not what other people can do for you, ask what you can do for others. Now, one of the difficulties in researching the origins of happiness is the problem of cause and effect. It's usually assumed that things like education, occupational status, uh, money, being employed, being healthy, being loved by friends and family will promote happiness. That's the underlying assumption with uh, a lot of the research that I've been describing. But it is also probable that to some extent happiness causes these things in return. Uh, or that they um, all share something in common 
intelligence might be one thing that uh, will mediate between them. But it's very clear that happy, optimistic people tend to attract more friends, for example, and retain their partners more than miserable people. Employers tend to favour happy, optimistic people as well. So they're more likely to get jobs and they're more likely to become wealthy. They're more likely to be proactive in looking after their health. So at the very least there are constitutional factors, personality, intelligence, uh, things like that, that can mediate all of those outcomes simultaneously and lead to the positive associations that we observe among them and it's not necessarily always the case that one of these variables is what is causing the happiness. It's also uh, probable that uh, there are different types of happiness, that, uh, that happiness is too broad uh, and unclear a concept to be dealing with, that we need to split it into types. Joy, inner peace, life satisfaction, global well-being, self-worth. These are all variables that have been measured independently and they all have slightly different relationships with the other variables. For example, one study found that having children had no effect on happiness but it significantly enhanced life satisfaction. See, it's all in the subtle wording, what, you, what the results are going to be. Another study found that high income improved life evaluation, but not emotional well-being. Again, separate concepts. Uh, there's no doubt that the meaning of happiness shifts with age and that young people tend to associate happiness with excitement, uh, you know, going to a fun fair and, uh, or riding a motorcycle at 120 miles an hour, uh, whereas older people tend to equate happiness with peace and contentment. And uh, the two are not just independent, but if anything, they are, they are polar opposites. So, obviously, happiness is an elusive, multifaceted phenomenon, and how you ask the question, I hope David Cameron is listening, uh, can have a <laughs> big effect upon the results. And uh, the final question is, we, we're talking about the pursuit of, pursuit of happiness, should we be pursuing happiness or letting it come to us? Because the happiest people are, are not necessarily those who directly go out and seek it. Pursuing happiness can be counterproductive. To a large extent, as I say, it emerges as a byproduct of who we are, what we're doing, and whether we're doing the right thing by our own values. People who focus on making other people happy usually manage to make themselves happy in the process. Uh, as, um, that's a rather nice uh, quote from Henry Thoreau there about happiness being like a butterfly. The more you chase it, the more it eludes you. Uh, but turn your attention to other things and it comes and sits softly on your shoulder. Or as Ralph Emerson said, happiness is a perfume that you cannot pour on others without getting a few drops on yourself. Thank you, Frank. Thank, thank you all.